morning, everyone. My name is Todd Kimball, and I will be your MC just briefly for a couple announcements at the beginning and the end. And our other MC, Helen Christians, will guide us through the majority of the program. Welcome to the first Sunday in March, the last Sunday of Standard Time. So daylight savings time next week. And welcome to Women's History Month. We're honoring that designation today. And I have lived a heavily quarantined life, but there is a woman who is an answer to a trivia question of my life during the pandemic. For a year, I've thought to myself, what is going to be the first event that draws me out of the house other than the grocery store? Is it going to be a movie? Is it going to be a concert, a sporting event? What is it going to be? I was just hoping it wasn't going to be the DMV. I wasn't going to allow it to be that. So the answer to that trivia question is Taylor Tomlinson. Saw her Friday night at Helium. She is mostly known for her Netflix special, A Quarter Life Crisis. And she is quite sarcastic and wise for a 27 year old. So perfect way to end my year of isolation. And with that, I will turn it back over to an encore of Pete and Paul. Mm -hmm. Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday, yes. Uh, who, there's a, a new uh, biopic, biopic, biopic out about her. And I just read a review of it, uh, or it was a transcription of uh, a Fresh Air interview in which some critic, jazz guy, said, the movie's got everything wrong about Billie Holiday which was the same for Lady Sings the Blues. But Billie Holiday was active in civil rights and all we ever hear about are the drug things. This one relates actually more to the drug things. She uh, had given her mother, bought her mother a house, I think. And then later on when she was in one of her drug stages and lost all of her money, she went to her mother for help and her mother refused her and closed the door on her. And oh. she supposedly yelled at her mother, God bless the child that's got his own. <laughs> and then she got together with the lyricist and they wrote the rest of it. We're gonna do the blood, sweat, and tears type version of it.
special extra enthusiasm and passion really enjoyed it today thank you <laughs> our pleasure <laughs> the strong woman who will be guiding us through the program today has been a tireless worker on behalf of hgp she's a leader on the program committee she's the mc every other week we like to call her the best mc in the group <laughs> please welcome helen christians <laughs> thank you thank you thank you um, we're, we're in for a real treat today, a real treat. Uh, folks have worked so hard and prepared and uh, practiced and Dave uh, Danucci helped us too. So um, we may have a few AV glitches, but just be, be patient with us. And uh, I think you're in for a real treat. Um, Pete and Paul, thank you. That was marvelous, just marvelous. Uh, couldn't thank you enough. And um, Billy Holiday's a great, great one woman of influence to start out with. Our next speaker is an uh, equally adored woman in our organization, um, Ann Henderson. And she's gonna be talking about uh, Maya Angelou. I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing a thing on, on Maya Angelou. And basically I'm reading a poem of hers. I, I, I think you all know about Maya. Um, uh, she was actually um, her, name as she went by during her younger years was Marguerite Johnson, or Rita. 
Uh, she was born in 1928, um, went to, um, her parents uh, divorced and uh, at three years old, she went to live with her grandma as a lot of kids did. And uh, she stayed there until she was about eight. And then her mother came and got her and, or actually her father came and got her and took her to her mom's house. Uh, in I think it was California, and uh, and there she lived for for quite a while. It was uh, during that time that uh, her mother uh, had married, and the stepfather abused uh, Maya. At that time, she was only eight, and it's an awful. Basically, she led, led a really bad life up until she was about twenty and uh, uh, went from parent to grandparent to father to, it, anyway, it was, it was tough, but she, she persevered. She really did. She, um, the, the one thing I like uh, that, that uh, gave her inspiration to me was that she did have a, a, a bad, uh, a bad life uh, in her beginning years but she didn't she she came from strong women uh her her grandmother was was very she was independent she she owned a, a grocery store in uh in the south uh that all of her uh, that the black people all came to and so she had she had some good uh a good foundation for uh being a strong woman and even her mother uh in between all the things that she did wrong, um, uh, was a, an, an independent and strong woman. And I think that that played to Maya. She changed her name to actually to Maya Angelou uh, in about 1954. She, she'd married a gentleman, a Greek man. It was not a, a, a the thing in that time. It was the 1951 that she was an interracial marriage. And, um, uh, his last name was Angelos, and so she she changed. Uh, she went by his name after that, uh, and and her nickname, which was also Maya. Um. Anyway, she started she she started a dance tree troupe. She did all these just incredibly courageous, to my mind, things. Uh, she she developed a good friendship in her middle years with Oprah Winfrey, which really uh, kind of shot her up to uh, fame. Uh, do you know that she, she was never a poet laureate? I didn't know that. I, I thought she was a poet, the poet, poet laureate of uh, the United States at, when, she was, uh, when she did the uh, inauguration of Bill Clinton, um, but, uh, but she wasn't. Anyway, um, she, she, uh, She's an inspiration to me. That's all I can say. I'm just going to read a poem. Here. It's called Phenomenal Woman. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman. Phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please and to a man the fellows stand or fall down on their knees. Then they swarm around me like a hive of honey bees. I say, it's the fire of my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman. Phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the grace of my style, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenal phenomenal woman, that's me.
Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care, because I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. That and Thank you so much. Our next uh, presenter will be Jamala uh, Kisses, uh, who will be um, presenting next. Come on. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I will share an excerpt of an article from radio TV station KQED from their series, Rebel Girls from Bay Area History. She was an organizer who proved invaluable to an entire generation of trans people. She helped to launch a magazine by and for gender nonconforming people. She is the reason Dr. Alfred Kinsey's landmark research into human sexual behavior included individuals living beyond the binary. Her name was Louise Lawrence. Born in 1912, and despite having always enjoyed wearing feminine attire at home, Louise tried for the first 30 years of her life to embrace being Lou, a responsible and low-key young man. She found work as a bank clerk at the age of 18 and married twice, first in her teens, then once more after the death of her first wife. It was only after her divorce that Lawrence fully embraced who she knew she was on the inside and began living full time as a woman. Unconsciously, she had been quietly preparing for this moment for years. Even while married, she regularly scoured newspapers for reports about public cross-dressing and then reached out to the people who had been arrested. In addition, she placed personal ads in the backs of magazines to find other trans and gender non-conforming people. Such was her, de tape, um, her determination that during a time when many transgender people felt obliged by law to live private lives, Lawrence saw fit to start educating doctors at the University of California at San Francisco with the goal of helping the medical profession understand that being transgender is not, in fact, a mental disorder. Her work at UCSF is what led her in 1948 to first come into contact with Dr. Alfred Kinsey, at the time the focus of national uproar for his book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. By then, Lawrence had built a network of almost 200 other trans people across America and decided to share some of their stories with Kinsey. Gender variance, after all, had been a glaringly absent from the sexologist's landmark work. Lawrence didn't just encourage Kinsey to include trans people in his 1953 follow-up, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. She helped directly to facilitate it. By 1950, Lawrence had, been, had become invaluable to Kinsey. He employed her to transcribe life histories, interviews, and transgender fiction. Lawrence, in turn, provided Kinsey with trans stories and novels, as well as her own personal correspondence, diaries, and scrapbooks. Were it not for Lawrence's contribution, it's probable that transgender would not have made it into Kinsey's final work at all. Still, for Lawrence, it wasn't enough to merely reach the academics. In 1952, she co-founded, along with Virginia Prince and others, the independent paper Transvestia, with the aim of bringing wider knowledge, acceptance, and understanding to the community. Importantly, it was Lawrence's extensive network of LGBTQ people that helped raise enough money to get the publication off the ground in the first place. Louise Lawrence's dedication to her own community was unsurpassed. Not only is she remembered for leaving her door open to individuals seeking gender reassignment surgery, 
She is known to have counseled them as well. To be labeled as a trans or gender non-conforming person during the period Louise Lawrence did her most outspoken work was to risk losing it all. Yet she never shied away from the difficult space, from the difficult task of carving out space for herself and the multitude of others like her. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was a very brave woman. And uh, in a time where it, she, she must have faced so much danger. So much danger. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, and so, thanks for joining our group. That was, uh, I was very, very glad you're here with us today. Thank you. All right. Jeff's, um, Jeff Strang will be our next presenter. Jeff, are you? This um, three ring binder is an example of what Del Allen gave to us members 19 years ago in HGP. And it has a lot of documents like um, HGP bylaws and um, a number of other official HGP um, documents and um, AHA um, information. And each one had a cover that um, had a different humanist on the front. And I picked this one because I did not know this person whose name is Taslima Nasreen. So the description on the front is from 19 years ago, but I also um, have some more updated information on her as long as I can get uh, permission to share my screen. Let's see if that does it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, um, Taslima Nasreen was born in 1962 in Maiman Singh in what is today Bangladesh, Taslima earned her MBBS degree from Maiman Singh Medical College in 1984 and later moved to Dhaka to complete her residency and work in a government clinic. But notoriety did not come as an anesthesiologist. Nasreen came to prominence in the late 1980s as a poet, columnist, novelist, and fiercely independent feminist. Attacks on her began in 1992 when Islamic militants grew angry over her candid writings on religion, feminism, and sexuality. After the publication of her 1993 novella, Laja, meaning shame, the story of a fictional Hindu family in Bangladesh made to suffer atrocities at the hands of Muslim fundamentalists, Nasreen had her passport confiscated, her book banned and burned, and bounties placed on her head. In 1994, following months in hiding, Nasreen gained amnesty under the auspices of the Women Writers Committee of the International PEN in Sweden and left Bangladesh. She returned in 1998 to be with her dying mother, inciting renewed calls for her death. Then the Clinton administration, the American Humanist Association, and others successfully called for Nasreen's safe exit from Bangladesh in 1998. And then you can see um, some of the, um, the highlights from later on after 1998. In uh, 2004, um, India granted her a temporary residential permit and she moved to Kolkata. And in, in 2007, um, the All Muslim Personal Board offered a large reward for her beheading. And uh, she was forced to move to New Delhi because of protests and riots. And in 2008, she was forced to leave India. 
um, and lived in Sweden in the US until returning to New Delhi. And the West Bengal government, which is a state in India where Kolkata is um, next to Bangladesh, um, that state refused to allow her entry there. And in 2015, she was threatened with death by Al Qaeda linked extremists and moved to the US where she's in the Center for Inquiries Secular Rescue Program. And I had not heard of this secular rescue program. So that was an interesting one to look up. A pretty brave woman. I mean, did, did she suffer physical harm? Did she ever, I mean, she, she was threatened through her whole adult life, basically. Right, yeah, I don't know um, any about the physical um, injury that she might have gotten, but definitely a lot of psychological. Yeah. All right, our next speaker will be Albert Christians, and he'll be doing a song for us today. Uh, I'm going to do a song. This is a song about a uh, woman who lived in the Old West. It's It was... Um, it orig the song originated from uh, E. Howard Thorpe, also known as Jack Thorpe, who was an, a cowboy song collector starting in the 1870s. Uh, sometime he was a cowboy and a song collector and a poet and a songwriter. And sometime in the 1890s, uh, he visited Judge Roy Bean down in, in far west Texas. And Judge Roy Bean told them the story of this song uh which took place in his uh his locale out there in far uh west texas and uh thorpe took the story home and within a few years had written a song about it and a few years after that he published this he published this lyric in his book of songs of the cowboys and uh so based on the on the word of uh judge roy bean this is a true story and to set the scene, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, we're going. Where the Pecos River winds and turns on its journey to the sea. From its white walls of sand and rock, striving ever to be free the highest railroad bridge that these modern times have seen dwells fair young Patty Moorhead, the Pecos River Queen. She's known to all the cowboys on the Pecos River wide. They know full well that she can shoot, that she can rope and ride. She goes to every coward, every roundup without fail. Looking out for all her cattle, branded walking hog on rail. Yes, she got her start in cattle, she got it with her rope. She can tie down any maverick before it can strike a load. She can rope and tie and brand it as fast as any man. She's known to all the cowboys as an A1 top cow hand. Across the Comstock Railroad Bridge, the highest in the West. Patty rode her horse one day, a lover's heart to test. For he told her that he'd gladly risk all danger for her sake. But that puncher wouldn't follow, so she's still without a mate. Albert, that was fun. Thank you. <laughs> but what, what do you, I, were there many women cow? in the you know in the west i mean w working women um the, i i the, the population was 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 heavily weighted toward males you know there 
there were 10% there, but uh, probably about 10% of the population in the Wild West was was women. But, you know, they were in essential roles. Right. Uh, they, you know, some of them, you know, some of them did laundries and co were cooks and, you know, some some were some were stagecoach drivers and 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 stagecoach guards and and uh, you know they would do they would do whatever had to be done because it was it was a uh, you know a do or die existence in particular in texas when uh during the um during the war between the states uh the, the generation that patty moorhead's mother would have been in if she if they were in texas it's not known uh, the women took care of all the ranches because the men all went off to war. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cattle, the, the wild cattle, uh, mostly originated in that time because the they, the women were, didn't have adequate uh, help to keep the, the uh, cows tied up on the ranches. But to the extent that the ranches survived at all during the war was a lot of women's work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Jill has a comment, being from brave women Texans, I wouldn't have followed anybody across that bridge. <laughs> so uh, that was a, thanks for the, the AV, that was very well done. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'll just say that yeah. she went across the bridge on a six foot wide pedestrian path alongside the railroad track, but there were no railings and it was about a hundred feet higher above the water than the Fremont Bridge here in Portland is. Wow, <laughs> and no guard, no rails. Some pictures of it, yeah. No rails, okay. and on a horse, you did it on a horse. Well, All right, well, thank you so much. Our next um, presenter is gonna be Sue Pierce. And well, speaking of women who helped to settle the West, mm -hmm. a different setting and a different part of the settlement of the West, I'm gonna tell you about Lalo Nathoy who was born September 11th, 1853, in a village in southern China, the oldest, eldest of uh, four or more children of a farmer. Her father called her his good luck, 1,000 pieces of gold. As was customary for uh, female children in those days, her feet were bound. Uh, part one picture, please. Okay, let me, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, young Chinese girl with bound feet. So there she is, or there is a young girl with her feet bound and notice how small they are. Um, the feet were unbound when she was 13 after she convinced her father that um, she could help him in the fields during um, some hard times. Um, uh, all of her brothers being uh, too young to yet work in the fields. The unbinding of her feet made her unattractive in China, but they never really fully grew, which affected her gait throughout her life. When she was 18, she was kidnapped by bandits who left her father two bags of seeds as payment. She was taken to a faraway city where she was sold to a madam in a Bagnio, um, picture number two, please. This is a young girl in a Chinese Bagnio. Um, and she was an, again sold to a woman who shipped her with many other girls to San Francisco, where she was again sold and then sent to Portland, um, where from which she traveled by um, uh, on a mule as part of a supply train, taking supplies to the gold mine fields of central Idaho territory. To her new owner, Hong King, who was an elderly Chinese saloon keeper in Warren's Idaho in the, in the gold mining fields, or Idaho territory. He, Hong King insisted that she use the name Polly. He was demanding, even cruel, um, as she worked for him in the saloon and uh, provided him sexual favors when he was able to perform. Along the way, there were um, 
men and women who, who did offer her some protection, who were kind. And one of those was um, Charlie Bemis, who owned the saloon next to Hong King's. On her first day, the day that she arrived in Warren's, he made it clear that he was protecting her both from Hong King himself as well as from the tavern patrons. She sometimes would slip next door, out the back door and into um, Charlie Bemis's saloon um, when she needed protection. Eventually, Charlie um, won her from Hong King in a poker game, at least according to some of my resources. Charlie built for her a boarding home, a boarding house, that, since she was no longer a tavern girl. I, um, and by this time she had learned to cook, to sew, manage a household, and she was quite skillful. She became a member of Warren's um, community life. Charlie was shot in the face by a, um, in a, this, a gambling dispute. Polly nursed him through months of, of recuperating um, as the wound healed and when he was likely in sepsis from a, an embedded bullet fragment that eventually they found and removed. Once again healthy, he took her to a, a favorite site, a favorite spot of his, um, 17 miles from Warren's, above the Salmon River. Polly loved that place. He convinced her to marry him, in part to secure her residency in the United States as laws were, were passed um, laws against undocumented Chinese. And she was undocumented having come as a slave. Her wedding um, was in 1894. And here's a picture of her in her wedding dress. Um, she allegedly, she's dressed somberly in back, which was acceptable. But underneath, she was dressed, had on red underwear. <laughs> it was a happy color in China. And it was her little secret, hers and Charlie's. The, her, her residency was finalized on August 10th of 1896. Bemis built a ranch on the site and uh, that became known as Polly's Place. If we could have part four, I think we have part four. Yeah, there it is. Here it is. Where they, where they ranched, they gardened, they, um, she cooked and canned and um, preserved food and entertained among friends and did not leave the site for somewhere between 25 and 30 years. While Charlie traveled back and forth to Warren's because he maintained the saloon. At one time they kept a cougar as a pet. They had raised from an abandoned cub uh, to the consternation of some of their guests. <laughs> cougar had its own dish at the table. Among their friends were Charlie Shep and Pete Clinken, Clinklehammer, who lived right across the Salmon River. Um, and I think it may be that that's their property in the distance. I could be wrong about that. Charlie developed a respiratory disease uh, with bloody sputum, likely tuberculosis, and gradually deteriorated gave over the years, gave up the saloon and became bed bound on the second floor bedroom of their home where um, Polly cared for him lovingly. One day while Polly was fishing in the salmon uh, just down the hill from their home, the house caught fire and, and was destroyed. Uh, Polly and Shep were able to carry Charlie 
down the stairs through the burning home and to um, rescue him. The two of them moved in with Shep and Klinkelhammer for several months until Charlie's death on October in October or November of 1922. He was buried at Polly's place. She then moved uh, to Warren's uh, where she took in uh, a schoolgirl who came from a rural family and was boarding in Warren's during the school year. This is not uncommon even in Idaho today, by the way. It helped her to heal um, the loss of Charlie's, of Charlie, although I'm not sure she ever really healed. At the end of the school year, she visited friends in Grangeville, Idaho, and then Boise, where she rode in an elevator and a streetcar and maybe a locomotive train and saw movies, did all sorts of things that she could never have imagined back in that Chinese village. She returned to Polly Place in 1924. Shep and Klinkelhammer, um, at her request, rebuilt the home and she gave them the deed so that they could take over the property at the time of her death. One day in 1930, oh, let's see. Let's have part six, the picture part six. This is Polly in Grangeville during that visit in 1924. And then let's go to part seven. This is Polly sitting on the porch of her uh, cabin in um, at Polly Place in 1933. Chef found her unconscious and incoherent in the in the garden of her home. He and Klinkelheimer took her to Grangeville on horseback um, where she was hospitalized in, for over a course of three months until her death on November 6th of 1933. She was buried in Grangeville. In 1987, the Polly Bemis house was restored. It became a museum, although I think it's still it became a museum in Wara, and the, the property may still be inaccessible by road, only by foot and horseback or ATV. But the home has become a museum. In 1988, it was placed on the National Registry of Historic Places. Polly was returned to um, reburied on the grounds at some time. And so from a poor Chinese girlhood, she became a part of the legacy of central Idaho, a pioneer, excuse me, a pioneer of the Salmon River, the river of no return. Idaho's most, according to one person, Idaho's most famous Chinese woman. A book which was the source of uh, so much of, along with Wikipedia, much of my information, a book entitled 1,000 Pieces of Gold is was written about her as an historic um, novel. And a movie of the same name um, was released in 1991. So yet another amazing pioneer woman. So our next uh, presenter is going to be, and let me double check, is going to be Robert Sanford. Robert, are you there? He's gonna read a few poems for us and I'll be sharing, we'll, we'll put the, uh, once he's introduced uh, himself, then we'll be, uh, I'll put the, the poems up uh, so you'll be able to read along, which will, which will be lovely. Great, thank you, Helen. I have two poems today by Rupi Kaur, a number one New York Times best-selling author and illustrator of two collections of her poetry. She started drawing at the age of five when her mother handed her a paintbrush and said, draw your heart out. <laughs> I hope you all got both meanings of draw there. Oh. Rupi views her, views her life as an exploration of that artistic journey. 
After completing her degree, she published her first collection of poems six years ago when she was 22. The collection sold well over 3 million copies, gracing the New York Times bestseller list every week for over a year. Ironically, this introduction was longer than the poems. Roger. Okay. What's the greatest lesson a woman should learn? That since day one, she's already had everything she needs within herself. It's the world that convinced her she did not. And the second poem of hers called Legacy. I stand on the sacrifices of a million women before me thinking, what can I do to make this mountain taller so the women after me can see farther? And the third poem by Edwin Markham, Outwitted. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. <laughs> and the final poem from my <laughs> great resource, Spoon River Anthology. This is Lucinda Matlock. The poems in Spoon River were kind of arranged from the front of the cemetery to the back. And the fools and the foolish and the clueless were buried in the front. And the further you went back in the book, the further you were going back to the rear of the cemetery, uh, where obviously you'll see in a second here, Lucinda Matlock lay. Lucinda Matlock. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap out at Winchester. One time we changed partners driving home in the moonlight of middle June. And then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I had reached the age of 60. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and for holiday, rambled over the fields where sang the larks, and by Spoon River, gathering many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys. At 96, I'd lived enough, that's all, and passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes, degenerate sons and daughters, Life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. Wow, Robert, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what were some of the, the, the beginning of the uh, poem? She was playing a game. Was it a card game or what? Do you yeah, know? I think so. Yeah, it was really, it was really interesting to have lost uh, what, eight? She'd lost eight children? In eight of 12. Yeah. Such sadness. Thank you so yeah, much. It was the, the, you know, the other story of the West. Yeah. Our, our next presenter is Kathy Humble. Kathy? I'd like to tell you about two impressive women, biologist and activist Rachel Smoker, and her mother, also a biologist, Rosemary Smoker. But first, some background. In 1957, my father finally finished his PhD, we left the soybean fields of Illinois for Long Island, New York. That year, the State University College on Long Island was launched in Oyster Bay with 148 students. Five years later, it moved to a brand new campus 30 miles away. Today, with nearly 30,000 students, it's called Stony Brook University and is one of the nation's finest research institutions. That first year, the college had a faculty of 14, all of them men. My father was the entire English department. For the next 30 years, he was in charge of all its writing courses. Likewise, Robert Smoker was the biology department. In addition to his decades of teaching, Bob co-founded the Environmental Defense Fund. Most of the faculty had wives and children. At 13, I was the oldest faculty brat. 
For the next four years, I had a babysitting monopoly, taking care of the younger ones, including Bob and Rosemary Smoker's two sons and daughter, Rachel. That's how I met Rachel Smoker when she was a preschooler. I finished growing up, so did Rachel, who earned a PhD in biology and behavioral ec ecology at the University of Michigan. She's become a noted environmental activist based now at the University of Vermont. She's co-director of Biofuel Watch and has worked with Climate SOS, the Energy Justice Network, Mobilization for Climate Justice, Global Forest Coalition, and Climate Justice Now. And there she is in a fairly recent photo. Um, she's done many presentations and protests opposed to becoming so gung-ho about biofuels that huge monocultures of them destroy much needed food crops and forest land. Most recently, she and others had protested a pipeline that would carry fracked natural gas from Canada through Vermont to states farther south. They plan to take that issue to the Supreme Court. But much earlier in her career, for 15 years, Rachel worked as a field biologist, part of the Shark Bay Dolphin Project, about 1,000 kilometers north of Perth, Australia. Her 2001 book, To Touch a Wild Dolphin, A Journey of Discovery with the Sea's Most Intelligent Creatures, is as interesting as Jane Goodall's writings about chimpanzees. Uh, Rachel's book is available at Multnomah County Library and also from Amazon, including a Kindle version. Rachel learned about Monkey Mia, a fishing camp on Shark Bay. It's a strangely named beach since it has no monkeys, but it does have a group of bottlenose dolphins tamed by local fishermen who for years fed them fish by hand in the shallows of the bay. And that is the edge of Shark Bay. Rachel first saw these dolphins in 1982. In subsequent years with a series of research grants and a small boat, an international team studied truly wild dolphins farther from shore in the main body of Shark Bay. Their first task was learning to recognize individual dolphins. Scars from shark encounters helped, plus ragged edges and nicks on their fins. So did the number of speckles on their bellies indicating age like tree rings. Over time, they named and cataloged about 200 they studied regularly. Some days the team focused on specific activities. Other times they do a follow, uh, staying with say stub nose, sickle fin, or another dolphin all through the day and listing its current status every five minutes. The researchers observed half a dozen different ways dolphins caught food, including banging fish with their tails. Dolphins even toted sponges to protect themselves from the spines of scorpionfish or stonefish while they foraged on the bottom of the bay. And there is a dolphin with the sponge sort of attached to his snout. Um, the researchers learned the many ways dolphins use sound echolocation, communicating among themselves, identifying each other with signature whistles, and disorienting fish so they'd be easier to catch. The team studied dolphin social structure, chiefly males hanging out with other males and females with other females. This is unusual among mammals with some exceptions like chimps and lions. There were no alpha do dolphins with a harem, no fights between males for mating rights. Instead, two or three males would form primary alliances, what Rachel calls gangs. There's perhaps a gang, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a bunch of dolphins, the right size. Um, sometimes two primary alliances would join to create a secondary alliance. The alliances would herd a single fertile female, sometimes becoming quite aggressive with her. Publication of these findings caused a ruckus. It was deemed politically incorrect to report such activities by dolphins, which had always been perceived as friend friendly and peaceable. Ironically, the more the world at large learned about the monkey Mia dolphins, the harder life became for them. On Rachel's first visit to Shark Bay, she'd had to hitchhike a series of rides up the coast from Perth. Soon, tourists were arriving by the busload. In 1990, the scruffy fishing village was replaced by a resort hotel, complete with tennis courts, swimming pool, and airport. Tourists were rough and clumsy with the tame beach dolphins and fed them inappropriately. Rachel once found a woman feeding a shrimp salad sandwich, mayonnaise and all, to a dolphin in the shallows. One year, the resort's septic system leaked into the bay, killing several dolphins. Monkey Mia is now part of a World Heritage Site, but the resort is still in the middle of it and is the biggest tourist, attra tourist attraction on Australia's west coast. I said I'd also tell you about Rachel's mother. Rosemary Smolker had a master's in developmental biology. She met her husband at Woods Hole Oceanographic Lab but she stopped in her professional tracks when her children were young and never went on to a PhD. Once Rachel was pretty much out of the nest, Rosemary was 
for 25 years, the managing editor of the Quarterly Review of Biology. She died in 2013 at age 88. And I think we, there she is, there's Rosemary, shortly before she died. When I first met her, Rosemary was 32. Like many other highly qualified faculty wives, including my mother, she was called just a housewife. Rosemary would have been fantastic as a biology teacher because that's what she was every day for Rachel. I often saw them together at the beach owned by the university. Rosemary would be showing Rachel how sea stars pried open oysters or how gulls drop mussels onto rocks to get at their food. At home, she even helped her daughter cut a tiny square in a chicken egg and use wax and a microscope slide to create a window for watching the chick develop. Rachel had endless questions. Rosemary always provided answers that left her daughter excited and wanting to learn more. In her book, Rachel says that her mother, quote, instilled in me an appreciation and interest in nature for which I am eternally grateful. So much for just a housewife. So much, thank you so much. Those were times like where women just put their careers aside. Uh, you know, girls today just wouldn't believe that. They, they, they hardly believe. They're like, well, you, you made the choice, you know, they, but there were so few choices um, for women that chose to, to have children. It, it, my, my daughter doesn't believe my stories of those times. No, she doesn't believe that the New York Times had separate ads for males and females yeah. in separate pages yeah. in the one ads. Yeah. yeah, it just wouldn't, it, it, they don't, because it, it's just so different. I, I see or, that in, I saw that in the hospital with the, the, so many women were surgeons. And when I started professionally, it was all men. It happened so quickly. It just was, and it just shifted and, it, and those doors opened for them. But I, I certainly, you know, what joy that, 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 uh, that family shared, the mom and the daughter shared um, to be able to explore together. And it, it, she made a significant difference in her daughter. Rosemary made a dif significant difference in Rachel's lives. That, you know, she had time with her kids. This is my, my, my thing now. Parents have so little time with their children with two, two parents working full time. It's, a, it's, it's sad that you know, it's gone. It, it's, it's, it's just uh, working, working, working and, and less time for the family. But anyway, thank you so much for that was great. And uh, these are, this is going very well. It's going very well. We, I think we may have some time uh, for some questions. Um, it looks like we're going to. So our last uh, formal presenter, we're gonna end with a video, but our last formal presenter is Del Allen. Del, come on in. So uh, my uh, report is on a lady named Letitia Carson, who lived from 1815 to 1888. Um, Letitia Carson came to the area that would become Oregon in 1845. She arrived in the company of David Carson. The exact nature of their relationship is a mystery. In later uh, family records, David's children described him as a man from a southern state. Letitia herself recorded that after he crossed the state line out of Missouri, David asked her to live and work with him until his death. Was Letitia an enslaved woman that David brought with him when he uh, decided to move west? Did he free her on the journey because slavery was outlawed in Oregon? Or was she always a free woman who entered an unusual agreement? Historians can only wonder. Letitia gave birth to David's child, a girl they named Martha Jane Carson, as they crossed the Rocky Mountains. When David, Letitia, and Martha arrived in Oregon, they were able to claim 640 acres of land as a family. David and Letitia built a small cabin to live in and settled into a life of hard farm labor. In 1849, Letitia gave birth to a little boy whom she and David named Adam. David Carson's land claim was reduced in to 340 acres in 1850. It is likely that this happened because the authorities learned he and Letitia were not properly married. Without an official marriage, they could not claim the amount of land given to married couples. David died in 1852, leaving Letitia with two young children. Two years later, in 1854, Letitia sued the administrator of David's estate, according to uh, Letitia. Um, 
you can put uh, exhibit one on now. David asked, had asked her to live and work with him for the rest of his life. In exchange, he promised to take, make Letitia his heir. But David left no written record of this agreement, so the executor of his estate had not given Letitia any of David's property or goods. She was suing to get what she believed was her fair share. Oregon Territory was, and what we see here was, uh, I'll explain in a minute. Oregon Territory was not a welcoming place for free black people. It had laws that barred free black people from owning land, suing in the courts, or even living in the territory. But Letitia would not be discouraged. She asked for $7,450 as a payment for the seven years she had worked for David. She also demanded an equal share in the sale of his cattle and other assets. On May 12, 1855, a jury of white male settlers awarded her $529.50 to cover both the work she had done for David and her legal fees. On October 25, 1855, she was awarded an additional $1,399.75 for the sale of David's cattle. It was nowhere near what Letitia felt uh, she was owed, but it was a remarkable victory for a free black woman in the Oregon Territory. After her uh, uh, court, court victories, Letitia took a job with the Eiffel family in Cow Creek Valley. Cow Creek Valley is about five miles west of uh, the Seven Feathers Casino on I-5 as you drive toward Ashland. She and her children lived in the Eiffel home. Letitia supplemented her income by performing midwife services for the local community. While working for the Eiffel family, Letitia saw Oregon become a state in 1859. In 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Homestead Act into law. The Homestead Act granted 160 acres of government land to any person who agreed to live on, improve the land and, for, and live on it for five years. If they fulfilled their agreement, the homesteader could then purchase the land for a very small registration fee. Now, she and David started out, started out with 640 acres, then it was cut to 340, and now she's down to 160 acres of government land. So anyway, the Homestead Act did not exclude people based on race or gender, or, and Letitia jumped at the opportunity to improve her family's financial situation uh, on June 17, 1863, she filed a homestead claim. She listed herself as a widow with two children. She did not claim to be a formerly enslaved person, which supports the theory that she was free when she entered into her relationship with David so many years prior. Letitia worked hard to fulfill her end of the Homestead Act claim and improved her land. She built a two-story home and a barn. She planted an orchard. She also cultivated a herd of cattle and pigs that she could sell at market. Letitia's hard work paid off. President Ulysses S. Grant certified her land claim on October 1st, 1869. She was the only black woman to secure a Homestead Act land, grant, land claim in the state of Oregon. In the 1870 census, Letitia was prosperous uh, Oregon landowner. The census taker estimated that her land was worth about $1,000 and that she had personal property worth about $625. Today, this would be over $30,000. Letitia continued to live and work on her ranch until her death on uh, February 2nd, 1888. So just another little bit here. Letitia Carson was a free black woman who lived in what is now Oregon from about 1845 until her death in 1888. After her partner, David Carson died, the administrator of his estate refused to grant property to Letitia and her and David's two children. She won back some of the assets in two 1855 court settlements and took a Homestead Act claim in 1862 in the Cow Creek Valley that we just mentioned, where she lived until her death. Her story and associated documents from the Oregon State Archives are now featured in the New York Historical Society online. 
So now um, let's go to back to exhibit one. Can we do that? There we are. Okay, this is what it says, and you can't read it, and it's very difficult to read because it's handwritten. To uh, Gruberry Smith, administrator of David Carson, deceased. <clears throat> Sir, take notice that I shall present to the probate court for the county of Benton appointed to be held on the second Mar Monday of March next for allowance the pre prepare property of which I have sustained in consequence of the now performance of the following perver contract made and entered into by and between the said David Carson during his lifetime and myself, and also the annexed account which said contract is in substance as follows. Once said account is in the words and figures following to wit. Something in the month of, sometime in the month of May or June in the year AD 1845, David Carson since deceased while on his road from Missouri to the territory of Oregon and after he had passed the state line of the said state of Missouri stipulated and agreed to and with me that in consideration, I would live with and work for the said David Carson for and during the time, uh, during the turn of his natural life that at his decease he would make me his sole heir or that he would give me his entire property which he should own or by possessed of at the time of his said deceased that in and figures following to with and only a lawyer could read that and get any sense out of it. So anyway, so <clears throat> land office at Roseburg, Oregon, June 19th, 1868, certified number 14. It is hereby certified that pursuant to the provisions of the act of Congress approved May 20th, 1862, entitled an act to secure homesteads to actual settlers on the public domain. Uh, I don't know where they get this idea as public domain. It's Indian owned land, in my opinion. But anyway, Letitia Carson made payment in full for west one half of northeast one quarter of track east one half of northwest one quarter of section 20 in township 29 south of range three west containing 153 and 89 one hundred acres. Now there it be known that on presentation of this certificate to the commissioner of the general land office, the said Letitia Carson shall be entitled to a patent, a patent nevertheless, for the track of land above described, John Kelly. So she became the first, as I mentioned, she became the first black woman to own property in the state of Oregon. We are um, at the end of our formal programs but there's a, a short video that um, several of our members uh, were showed me, and um, we're going to close our presentation with that. I want to give a real sincere thank you to everyone that um, performed today. It was marvelous, just marvelous. And uh, here we go.
that kind of says it all. <laughs> and uh, just want to thank everyone for participating. This has been kind of a tradition. It has been a tradition. We've done this every every year for uh, as the first Sunday in March, and so glad we could continue today. And and thank you for your attention, and um, thank you for everyone that participated. What a wealth of information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Todd, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Helen, for guiding us through the program today so eloquently. And this is a very nice tradition, very uh, worthwhile. I want to compliment our members today for digging deep this year. Many of the women featured today I did not know about. So uh, we did uh, some great research and fine presentations. So I'm really happy that we do this. It's become a tradition, uh, a little bit like our talent show, something to look forward to every year.